Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we look at verse 172, which reads, Yo pube, yo cha pube pamatitwa, pacha so na pamatiti, so mang lo kang pabhasiti, abhom tova chandima. Which means, He who was, uh, whoever, whoever was heedless before, negligent before, but afterwards is no longer heedless, no longer negligent. Such a person, so mang lo kang such a person lights up this world. like the moon when it comes out from behind a cloud. So this famous, another famous Dhammapada verse uh, was taught in re relation to a, a monk with a broom. It's also mentioned, I think, in the next one, which is more famous. The story coming up or not the next one, but a couple from now. There's a story that's more famous that we'll look at, and I think the verse is mentioned there, but it's not the verse of the story. Uh, anyway, this story... The story is about a monk with a broom. And so the story goes that there was one monk called Samun, Samunjani who was always sweeping. He would sweep in the morning, he would go for alms, and when he came back he would sweep, 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 sweep the monastery. There are these sorts of monks, I've seen these sorts of monks in various monasteries that I've lived in or visited monks and, and nuns who sweep a lot or who work a lot who do this or that work and are always busy and not only did he do this himself but one day he went and saw Rewata Rewata who was uh, the foremost in terms of seclusion he was among the Buddha's disciples I think that's what it was. Anyway, he was a monk who delighted in seclusion, who never wanted to be around people, just wanted to be off on his own. Uh, so he lived in a, he, he normally lived in a very dense and impenetrable jungle. It's the kind of place where nobody else would want to go. Uh, he was, he was interesting that way. But here he seems to have been in Jetavana, just probably to visit the Buddha. And he saw Revata, this monk Samunjan, he saw Revata sitting there with his eyes closed. And he, he noticed that Revata would, would just sit around all day and, and not do any work. And he thought to himself, this monk, you know, he goes and, and takes the food, takes people's food, and then he comes back and he doesn't do any sweeping. He could at least sweep out one room. And Rewata, I think, had some kind of power because he seems to have known what was going on in this monk's, this other monk's mind. The other monk called him, Samunjani called him a great idler. He was idle. And so Rivata says, mm, I should teach him, I should teach this monk something. And so he called the monk over and he explained to him, he said, look, of course you should be sweeping, you should sweep first thing in the morning and go for alms and then come back and, and practice meditation, basically. A very simple teaching, he said. 
but he gave him a, a, a specific meditation practice and said, then in the evening, then you can go and sweep again. So you sweep in the morning, sweep in the evening, but you really need to give yourself a chance, he says. Okas, okaso katam, or something like katabo, or something like that. One should give oneself the opportunity to do something more meaningful. And so this monk took his admonishment and as a result became enlightened. Now when he was, after he became enlightened, he no longer swept. He swept a little in the morning and some in the evening. And well, the monk saw that this, this sweeping monk no longer did his work and so the rooms got a little bit uh, dingy, and dusty. He saw that the other monk saw that the monastery was no longer spick and span like it used to be. And so they came up to him and they said, well, why aren't you, why aren't you sweeping anymore? And he said, oh, ven a venerable, so I, I used to do that when I was heedless. Now, however, I've become heedful. And the monks heard this and they were indignant because they thought, Look at listen to this monk pretending to be someone, something enlightened or something like that. And so they went to see the Buddha and they said, they told the Buddha, they said that there's this monk who's, he used to work, but now he just in order to laze around, he, he claims to be an arahant, claims to be somehow enlightened. And the Buddha said, no, no, it's true. My son, he calls him my son. My son used to be heedful when he was heedless or used to be heedless. When he was heedless, he spent all his time sweeping. But now he spends his time in the bliss of enlightenment and therefore sweeps no more. And then he said, yo pube pamajitva and so on. He was heedless before. Heedless no more. Illuminate, illumines this world as does the moon freed from a cloud. So I think, again, we separate the story and the verse, since the verse isn't really all that related to the story. But the story has an interesting lesson. It's the question of work, and more generally, how we, how we spend our time. And so you can apply this to ordinary life and, and all aspects of our life where we occupy ourselves with the various tasks, sometimes caught up in ambition, where we, we have some kind of drive that drives us to work very hard. Uh, sometimes it's a drive for money or power or status or respect. Often there's a sense of, of pride and righteousness. You know, I'm a hard worker, I worked hard, and look what I've got to show for it. I met, Amer I met some Americans, uh, when I was living in America, I met people who were quite indignant that monks should not work. As though there were something noble or, or right, and, and many people truly feel this way, there's something noble and right about working. Thoreau said, uh, to give a modern example, he commented on this and he said, this is, these people, they're like, uh, they're like oxen, you know, they work, 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 work very hard, but you know, what, what's the point? And they seem somehow to feel like it's right, there's a rightness to the work that we do. We're taught, you know, we're taught that this is the right way to live. It's right to have a job. Anyone who doesn't have a job is a bum, an unemployed bum. And so you had this, this movement in America called the Dharma Bums. And I'm assuming it was somehow related to this sort of as a counterculture of people who realized, well, you don't really need to work, you know? There's no imperative to be a 
hard-working individual in the world. I imagine they were probably a little bit lazy, the sense I sort of get from it. I mean, in fact, I think work is quite valuable. It's just a question of what is the right work. And Rewata makes clear in this uh, story that it's not that one should never work uh, in, in, in terms of physical labor or, or cleanliness or so on. It's that that shouldn't be one's ultimate concern. There are uh, mundane necessities. We have to eat, we have to live, we have to care for our possessions. But the, the point is to not let them own us, right? To not let our work consume us, to not let our possessions control us. And we can see as, as we're mindful to what extent this is the case and we naturally incline towards simplifying our life as we see the the, uh, the complexity and the, the busyness, the overall lack of opportunity, as Rewata says, opportunity to perform the more meaningful work. I think it's a reminder to us. So the story is an important reminder that busyness is not in and of itself valuable. But work and, and uh, ener energetic effort, this is valuable. Now as for the story, uh, the, the, as for the verse, This verse is quite famous. I think it's both inspiring and instructive. I mean, it's a clear reminder of what is important. This word apamada that we talk about so often. You don't hear about so much in English, I think, but the Pali word apamada, it's hard to translate because pamada means, pamada really means uh, intoxication of some sort, but it's not intoxication with uh, alcohol. It's emotional intoxication or mental intoxication, mental mm, uh, drunkenness. When you're drunk on greed or anger or delusion or all three. Pamada is not being mindful. The Buddha said again and again that it's mindfulness. When you're mindful that's what it means to be un, unheedless, un, unnegligent, non-negligent, to be sober. You know, mindfulness is like waking up. This is why this imagery is so, uh, so uh, powerful. It's like, it really is like coming out from behind a cloud where you, you light up the world when you're sitting at night and the moon comes out and the whole world is lit. This is like when mindfulness arises in the mind, it's like you were asleep. It's like you were in a dark room and you can only now see things as the light is turned on. It speaks of uh, the condition of being in the wrong in the past. That we shouldn't be too discouraged. My teacher would often recite this verse to people who were discouraged about their past, bad things they had done, feeling guilty about them, feeling perhaps uh, uh, un unqualified for the task at hand because of their past. And he would say, oh, that's all in the past. Don't, who you were in the past is not important. You're now doing, doing the right thing. And then he would recite this verse. 
we shouldn't dwell in the past. We, we should acknowledge uh, that we're all coming out of darkness. We're all coming out of delusion. And be clear that of, of what takes us out of delusion. And more important, be inspired by how profound and wonderful is the change that comes when one is mindful, how it lights up your mind. It lights up the earth, how it is. It relates to the story in the way that it is the most important work, the most valuable work. The Buddha doesn't just say that this person brings light to themselves. He, he says this person lights up the world. And so in a way it's, a, it's an implication that they do the most important work because they bring light to the world. A person who is mindful. You know, if you think about what, what is accomplished through the work that we do, you ask yourself, these people who are proud of, anyone who is proud of their job or their, their um, fastidiousness, their... their effort that they put into worldly affairs. I ask them what is the result? If I make if I make things or if I just crunch numbers or if I uh, sell things or so on. Ask yourself what are you accomplishing with your work? Even for yourself you're only gaining money but if you ask what are you doing for other people? What are you doing for the world? I mean, it's, it's quite useful for those people living in the world to ask, what is, what is it that I'm doing? What, what, is it, what, what, if, uh, what effect does my job have on the world? Does my work have on the world? I think that really frames things in a more favorable light for, for a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist meditator. Because the effect of our work the work that we do as, as meditators by, by cultivating mindfulness it brings about the best result you know it, it, it reduces at the very least the amount of greed anger and delusion the amount of defilements in the world but moreover it provides a a source and a resource for this, the spread of of, uh, of mindfulness, of enlightenment, of peace, you know, of, of purity, of, of an absence of all those things that are causing the, the, the problems. It's like this, this illness, this virus that spreads. The human race is like an organism that is crippled by a debilitating illness. It's living living and getting by and there's a lot of good that happens in the world but you can always see that it's sick. The human race is sick. It is ill. And so we're spreading the cure, the antivirus to the practice of meditation, of curing the human race. Now whether it will ever be cured. I mean, I think it ebbs and flows, but there's no question or no doubt about the result of the, the practice of meditation and mindfulness when it does occur. So, it speaks of the result of mindfulness. When a person is mindful, when a person is no longer caught up in heedlessness, caught up in indulgence. And suddenly the world, it's like everything is set right. Suddenly you're here, you're present, you're aware, you're awake. Your mind is clear. Just like the moon when it comes out from behind the cloud. It's just good imagery. Yeah, it's a good verse. So that's the Dhammapada for this week. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.